Needless to say, the kind of unsavory language and expressions that we heard yesterday do little to assist the chair in managing question period proceedings, and I urge all members to be judicious in the expressions they choose to use. I also ask all members to heed my request of last January 28th when I asked members, quote, to consider how the House can improve things so that observers can at least agree that question period presents an exchange of views and provides at least some information. The onus is on all members to raise the quality of both questions and answers, unquote. All right, Speaker Andrew Scheer, he's basically saying, Tom Mulcair yesterday said, you're, uh, you're losing your neutrality in this position because you're not forcing the government to give better answers to our good questions. And today he said, hey, up to you guys to provide the answers. I'm not going to tell you what qualifies more or less. Uh, so let's get the opinions and thoughts from our Wednesday trio of MPs uh, from all three major parties. They're joining us for their weekly look at all these issues and more. Aaron O'Toole is our parliamentary secretary for the Conservatives. Ginny Sins is the BCMP for the New Democrats. Yvonne Jones holds down Labrador for the Liberals. Welcome to you all. Welcome back. Yeah. You're not Stella Ambler, but she's on tomorrow. You're on this panel now, so good I'll to go. I'll do my best. Good to go. <laughs> uh, I want your thoughts for, on the Speaker's ruling. Uh, Jenny, I'll go to you first. It was your leader that challenged uh, the Speaker. Um, you know, really, uh, should the Speaker be directing questions to be answered, or is that opening a big can of worms because he's going to be deciding what qualifies as an answer and what doesn't? I don't think it's the role of the uh, Speaker. The speaker to be defining how accurate the answer is. But I do think that uh, we have a parliamentary question period for a reason. And I know it's called question period, but usually when you pose a question, there is some expectation that the answer will be in the right kind of zone. So when you're asking questions, and a very serious question about Canada's commitment in Iraq mm -hmm. and the timing of that, and to get chatter back about a Facebook and about Israel, I think was just inappropriate. No different than um, Mr. Calandra talking about pizzas and delivery boys when we were asking him questions about Mr. Duffy. So he has a habit of doing this. Look, the way you answer a question can vary, but surely, and I still have that question as a parliamentarian, it should at least still be on the topic. And Ivan, you've only been here for, what, about a year and a bit now? Mm -hmm. Seriously, how many times do you actually see a legitimate answer to a question? I mean, they don't do it. Well, Nobody does it. You very Liberals didn't do it before <laughs> the Conservatives were in government. It, it, it's, to, it's the role of politics. Uh, you very seldom see direct answers, but normally what you do see is governments stick to the topic at hand as being debated. Um, in this case, uh, the arrogance that was shown by the government side was in, in my opinion, unnecessary. Uh, it was disrespectful to the Canadian public, and at the very minimum, they should have acknowledged the seriousness of the issue that was being raised on the floor. Having said that, Mr. Mulcair also knows that you don't challenge the speaker in the way that he did yesterday. And because government don't always give you the response that you want or be tolerant of your questions is not a reason to take, uh, take on the speaker in the House of Commons. So I, I think Mr. Mulcair does, should apologize for his actions uh, towards the speaker. It's not the first time you've seen it. I'm sure it won't be the last in the House of Commons, but most parliamentarians will acknowledge that you don't treat the speaker in that fashion, irregardless, and, and do apologize. Now, since Aaron O'Toole would always give a clear answer to every question he's asked, <laughs> and I've seen you give good answers, by the way. I don't, I don't think he's really much of a cheap shot artist like some of them are, but Aaron, why don't why doesn't the government, on serious questions that are of a legitimate public interest, at least try and frame an answer, even if they can't give you specifics? On this case, they might be helping ISIS figure out what we've got on the ground there. But and you're, you're a veteran, you understand the need for national security. But why don't they at least try and answer within the same geographical area, like Iraq, instead of firing off into Israel and other areas that uh, Mr. Calander seemed to go into? Uh, look, Don, I, I uh, really enjoyed the Speaker's intervention today because it reminded us that, uh, and this is what he said, it is up to the House and it's up to all members, government and opposition, to make sure that um, they take House procedure properly. Mm -hmm. And if it's not up to the Speaker to decide whether it's a good answer, whether it's relevant, um, and if the, if the opposition doesn't like a response, um, they should pursue that line of questioning. That's happened before and actually opposition parties have 
have uh, made hay with that. What concerns me is this is not the first time Mr. Mulcair has challenged the, the role of the Speaker. Like it, he, in his fits of anger, seems to forget the fact that the Speaker has a difficult job and should never be pulled into that. And, and I'm glad uh, Speaker Scheer mentioned Speaker Milliken because uh, very highly regarded. Um, so look, the real issue here that Thomas Mulcair was asking about has been talked about regularly. In fact, the Minister of National Defence appeared in all-party committee to talk about the Canadian Forces deployment. I've talked about it, uh, being a veteran and former CF member, um, and the Prime Minister has talked about it. Um, the real issue, I think, is Mr. Mulcair has never asked for a debate in the House on deployments before, deployments of ship to NATO fleet, deployment of the Army to, to Poland. This is another deployment of advisors, and we have said that if in the future at some point anything would go to a combat role, it would come to the House. So to say that because there's a deployment there needs to be a debate, he hasn't asked for that before, it sort of shows the NDP don't understand defense issues. Can I ask you quickly before I move on, I just want to get a point of clarification. Stephen Harbour mused today about the uh, Iraqi uh, mission. Uh, that he might bring it to the House of Commons because he's been asked to expand or extend it by the President Obama. By President Obama. It seems to me if it goes to the floor of the House of Commons, it goes there if it's a combat mission. Well, I think there's discussions going on in, in New York likely today. We're constantly in discussion with our allies about the security threat globally. And some of it which could strike here because mm -hmm. we've seen some of the militants actually being drawn from Calgary and other cities. So we're constantly talking as allies. What the Prime Minister said when, when some advisors were deployed, about 60 to 70 I believe, was that, that uh, those advisors would be reviewed at a 30-day period and that's normal for military operations you sort of review what you're doing who you sent how many you sent at a 30-day level mm -hmm. the commitment that the Prime Minister has made and he made this as a result of the Afghanistan mission is before Canada gets into a combat role um, that will be a debate in the House of Commons and I think it'll be important to debate this because Canada takes a strong position with our allies on, on global security. Yeah, Jenny, can you clarify exactly where the NDP is on this? We shouldn't go put any troops into Iraq at all, and I guess you'll oppose any move into combat if that comes to that. Well, first of all, I think it's a slippery slope, because once you send troops over there, what is their role, and exactly who's, who are they taking command from, and is it going to engage supporting other people who might be in a military mode? But Absolutely, the same Prime Minister before he became Prime Minister said any kind of a role played by the military overseas needed to be debated in the House. And I think that's where it should, the debate should take place. Look, we've learned some lessons from our recent engagements in the past. And I think the Canadian public, at a minimum, would require us to debate this issue in the House mm -hmm. and we will look forward to that debate and it's always important for us I think whenever you're engaging or sending soldiers overseas that we have that serious debate and we need to have a plan I'm not saying that the plan needs to be all flushed out but really it's been very difficult even getting out of this government when the 30 days will end and we no, got the answer 5th, today right? this is what they don't understand we John. got the we, answers today we have people and overseas I will say, all the time and sure. i will say this can i also Very say quickly. i think just the leader at, turning to the speaker at first and saying look i'm asking about iraq and i've asked twice and the answers are about israel I don't think you can portray that as anger. You can portray that as like, frustration. Let's give let's give us the answers because yeah. what we're seeing from across the way is disrespectful of the Canadian public. Ivan, we're literally, uh, I'm sure it's momentarily, we're going to Stephen Harper in New York talking to the UN Security Council. And one thing that's quite interesting, Jean Chrétien uh, said, we will not go into Iraq, last go around, without a UN mandate from the UN Security Council. Didn't get it didn't go in. Uh, if the UN Security Council gives the green light to this to go further and harder against ISIS, do you think the Liberal Party of Canada has any choice but really to say I mean, we have to do it? Well, obviously, there, there's always a choi choice. Um, our big concern is right now is where Canada is in terms of the Security Council of the United Nations. Um, from 
we don't have a seat at the table. Um, you know, Harper has never really taken the United Nations seriously in terms of their role and mandate in the world. Obviously, that is causing all of us uh, concern in Canada uh, because there's going to be major decisions that are made, and they will be made at this level without the input of Canada. And uh, and for the first time in our history, I, I guess we're we are not at that table. We are not a part of that decision-making process. So in, in light of what the decision is as it pertains to um, Iraq at this stage and whether we go in there underground or whether we don't, um, I think it's, it's understood by all Canadians, regardless of the fiasco that occurred yesterday in the House of Commons, that before Canada would engage in a combat war, that it would be debated in the Parliament of Canada. And I think that's understood right throughout this country. Uh, it has been precedent setting. It has been an, a topic of debate in the past elections. It has been commitments and committed to by leaders in this country. So Canadians expect that at this stage. Okay, let's wrap it up because I think we're going live to New York where the United Nations Security Council is uh, going to hear from Stephen Harper right now. Here it is. And by giving the invitation to other countries as well, the threat posed by foreign terrorist fighters is a source of great concern. The conflict in Syria and in Iraq calls upon increasing people worldwide. This includes Canada. The number of foreign fighters in Syria and Iraq is, of course, not only aggravating an already dangerous regional security situation, but for us, it involves the risks that individuals may return home with knowledge and experience gained in terrorist activities to motivate and recruit others and potentially to conduct attacks. Canada is taking action on this. In 2013, we brought forward the Combating Terrorism Act, which created new criminal offenses of leaving or attempting to leave Canada for terrorist purposes. Recent amendments to the Citizenship Act will also enable us to revoke citizenship from dual citizens and to deny it to permanent residents who are convicted of terrorism offenses. We're also using existing tools to take appropriate action to counter foreign fighter threats, including passport revocation, the listing of terrorist entities under the criminal code and the supporting and supporting capacity building initiatives abroad. And as we go forward, uh, we are examining how to strengthen all of these and other tools. Of course, terrorism and crime for terrorist purposes cannot, as has been recognized here, be prevented by security and law enforcement alone. It is aussi essentiel it is also essential to support the effort of prevention to fight violent extremism before certain individuals become foreign fighters. And I should mention that in Canada, our security and intelligence agencies work well and work most particularly well with our Muslim communities in identifying such threats. It's also important, of course, that we track and squeeze off terrorist financing wherever possible. Uh, Mr. Uh, Secretary, Canada is uh, pleased to co-sponsor the resolution today and to support efforts to improve the international response to the foreign fighter phenomenon. Of course, we will also continue to work with the government of the United States, the government of Iraq, and our other friends and allies in a range of humanitarian, political, and military assistance to those fighting this phenomenon in the region. Merci, thank you. Your Excellency, Mr. Prime Minister, thank you very much. Okay, Stephen Harper uh, giving brief uh, comments to the United Nations, talking uh, quite a, most of his speech was dealing with how Canada is combating homegrown terrorism and trying to prevent that from being exported and then returning back to Canada to train more. He did though, pledge uh, that he would support all humanitarian, political and military activity to wipe out ISIS along with the United States. A uh, quick thought from you, uh, Aaron O'Toole. Uh, did you think the Prime Minister covered the bases he had to? 
I think so. It talks well of our balanced effort in this in this area. We've done some domestic changes to try and root out this homegrown terror. Last year, we we uh, criminalized people that would leave Canada to train with terror organizations, mm -hmm. membership in terrorist organizations, were revoking passport. Opposition don't support most of these measures, which is of concern. We are also doing the humanitarian side. We're one of the largest per capita donors to some of the resettlement of displaced people uh, in Syria. We're also uh, resettling uh, 1,800 or more Iraqis and, and Syrians as part of the refugee response, which is one of the larger ones, again, on a per capita basis. And then the advisory role, you know, the Prime Minister spoke about military assistance. Our assistance right now is in that advisory capacity. And I think he, he uh, highlighted an important fact that actually goes back to what Ravon was saying is Canada is a proud part of the United Nations. We're also a strong member within NATO and within NORAD and we're in constant discussion and at the table in a variety of tables uh, to combat this issue and I would suggest NATO will increasingly be uh, a more important player as this sort of global terror and sort of homegrown terror phenomenon combine. Jenny Sams, any concerns from the NDP perspective and what you heard just a few minutes ago? Well, you know, looking forward to having that debate in Parliament, in the House of Commons. Only and, if we're going uh, into combat. But, you know, as soon as you have uh, uh, boots on the ground, you know, uh, then you have to worry about the safety of the soldiers or other personnel who do go out. But I really want to take uh, a little bit of, uh, let's say, offence at this term that, you know, we're really working well with the United Nations. Ever since I've been sitting in Parliament, I've seen our government more fighting with the United Nations, whether it's over the rapporteur or any other report or any other resolutions they have. We don't really have a critical role. What our Prime Minister got to do was to speak for a few minutes. He's made his pledge. The UN had a critical uh, issue. They were talking about climate change, environmental issues. Our Prime Minister did not bother to go there, and that really disturbs Canadians. But even today, we are not there at the United Nations Security Council. We don't have a seat there, we don't have a voice there, okay. and I really, really worry about uh, how we're going to be on the outside, and yet the Prime Minister is already making commitments. Hold on, you want us inside, but you don't want us in the mission. I don't know about that one. I said inside at the table when decisions are made. Yvonne Jones, your reaction to the Prime Minister's speech briefly? Um, nothing new in what the Prime Minister had to say. It's basically what he's been saying at home, uh, what our role is being overseas in, in those missions. Um, you know, so there's nothing di different there, just bringing the message to a different venue. Um, but I, I have to comment on what Aaron said again in our relationship with the United Nations. Don't, don't trick Canadians into believing that that's a solid relationship. And it's unfortunate because Canada was always a prominent player. We could be a prominent player today, but it's the decision of the Prime Minister to take the role that he's taken as it relates to the United Nations, leaving Canada outside of the door when some major decisions are being made. All right. Thank you all. It was uh, perfect. We appreciate you coming in and giving that assessment.